when you see yourself represented in a book or, or wherever in the media, then you start to get an idea of like, oh, that could be me. Like my life could look like that. So like, a, you know, a cisgender kid says they read this book in preschool and they think, oh, maybe someday I'm going to grow up and marry a person or like whatever. Um, and if you don't see yourself, then that sort of creates this like, like empty, like, oh, I don't know if I even exist. And that can get really complicated, like psychologically to be like, I don't see a future for myself. Good afternoon, my name is Sarah Howard and I'm the Youth and Community Services Manager here at the Danube Regional Library. And we are thrilled today to have a program that takes three little organizations getting together. And those are our favorite types of programs. We have the Center Project, we have Children's Grove and the Library. And this program is being recorded. So if you know somebody that couldn't be here, please let them know. But we're here to have a panel from the Center Project to discuss representation of LGBTQ plus youth with regard to schools and book bans and kindness and acceptance and support. So I'm gonna turn it over to Cameron, who's also the vice president of the Center Project. And they're going to help lead us and moderate this panel. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for having us. <laughs> We're glad to be here. Um, so as Sarah said, my name is Cameron Lee. I'm with the Center Project and we have folks from two of our different groups here. I'll let people talk a little bit more about that in a second. But as Sarah said, we're here today um, to talk a little bit about the impact of kindness and acceptance and inclusion on LGBTQ youth. Um, several months ago when um, Margie had reached out to us to see if we could do this panel, we started you know, turning our gears about how we would have this conversation. Um, and then in the last you know, three or four weeks, we've experienced here in Missouri an unprecedented sort of onslaught of anti-LGBT legislation, particularly anti-trans legislation, the primary goal of which is to sort of exclude trans people and trans women and girls in particular from the public arena. And we know that that obviously has a big impact on um, the mental health and well-being of young people. And so we thought that this sort of provided a, a frame or a context to sort of shift the narrative about how we talk about um, LGBT youth and their well-being and the resources that they need. Um, so, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about, um, the impact of family support and inclusion, spend a little bit of time talking about, um, the positive impact of accessing care and resources, having, um, uh, access to school participation through sports and extracurricular activities, and then also seeing representation of ourselves in the media, in books, and in schools. Um, so I wanted to take just a moment at the front end to thank the library and Children's Grove for creating the space and opportunity for this important conversation. Um, I wanted to make a note that you can submit questions anytime through the chat and those will come directly to us. We'll do our best to answer them and there will be time at the end of the conversation to ask some direct questions. Um, and with all that being said, I think we'll just jump in. So I just wanted to share a little bit more about myself and then I'll let our panelists introduce themselves. Um, as I said, my name is Cameron. I use he, him pronouns. I am uh, an adult, but I am a transgender adult, and so I have um, some experiences and perspective of the impact of kindness and acceptance in my own family, in my own life, and the impact that um, transition and access to resources has had for me. Um, and so the rest of us here, we're sort of a Venn diagram of things. Some of us are LGBT, some of us are young people, some of us are parents of LGBT people, some of us are all of those things. Um, so I would let... Um, I think, Paige, if you could go ahead and jump in and introduce yourself. And if you would, we have representation here from PRISM, which is our group for young people, and also Parents for Parents, which is our group for parents. So Paige, if you would go ahead and introduce yourself and say a little bit about PRISM, and then I'll let the parents talk a little bit about themselves in P4P. Definitely. Hi, everyone. I'm Paige. My pronouns are she, they, and I am a board member at the Center Project, and I am also a PRISM coordinator. So PRISM is a group for LGBTQ youth in mid-Missouri for kids 11 to 18 years old. They come and hang out at the Center Project House a couple times a month and just get to have a safe space when we do fun activities together. Um, so I'll be speaking from my perspective as a PRISM coordinator and also personally, I'm 24 years old so I and I am a lesbian. So recently a young slash still a young uh, LGBTQ community member. Thanks, Paige. Um, Jen, Michelle, and Christy, um, whoever wants to jump in first and, and be sure to say some words about P4P if you would. 
Sure, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Jen Harper. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a parent of two wonderful daughters, one who identifies as trans and one who um, is cisgender, which some people don't know the term cisgender means that um, she identifies with the same um, sorry, she identifies as she was the same as she was uh, assigned at birth. So I have two different kids with two very different life experiences. And when my daughter had come out, I knew very, very little about the LGBTQ community. And so I did what I usually do is seek different resources. I'm a research engineer by, uh, by trade. So finding data and information is kind of what I do. Um, and I knew I was messing things up. So I really sought out support from other parents who'd been through this journey. And that's when I found Parents for Parents, which we refer to it as a support group, but I kind of don't like that term because it makes it sound like there's something wrong. But really it's, we're supporting each other and how we can be the best parents to our children as possible because they do have certain needs and um, things that are going on in their lives that other parents don't really understand. So I'll turn it over to the next person. We can't hear you, Michelle. <laughs> so sorry, I was muted. Um, my name is Michelle. I, uh, my husband and I have four children, one of whom is a member of the LGBTQ community and he is trans, came out probably about mm, seven-ish years ago. Um, and I am a preschool teacher and like Jen, uh, education is very important to me. And so seeking out information and learning about the community has just become a goal for me. And um, I am one of the co-facilitators of Parents for Parents, which is the group at the Center Project that Jen was speaking of that meets to support uh, families that are also on the journey of supporting and celebrating their LGBTQ kids. We meet every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at the Center Project on Hickman Avenue, which is just north of Columbia College. So any parents that would like to join us either um, in person at our meetings or through our Facebook group, we would love to have as many participants as possible. Okay, and I am Christy. I'm a psychologist by trade and work in private practice in the community in Columbia um, and have a longstanding interest in working with queer and trans folk which came in super handy when two of our three kids um, came out in a variety of ways over time um, with a variety of identities around their sexuality as well as their gender. Um, and so at this point, um, we have kids who identify in a lot of different ways and fortunately had the knowledge both from our connections at um, the Center Project and P4P and also just Kind of long-standing advocacy and friends in the community. So I'm excited to be here. And I think y'all have said all of the important things about P for P. Thank you all so much. Sometimes when we're doing a panel or presentation, we're sharing all this great information and then we at the very end we're like, oh also we're from P4P. <laughs> and so I thought it was good to maybe start on the front end so folks as they're learning this information in this conversation can know right off the bat uh, where they can go to get some more support and resources. So um, I, I alluded to this a little bit in the introduction, but I think a good place for us to start is um, to talk about how we're gonna approach this discussion in a little bit of a different angle today um, and sort of reframe the narrative about how we talk about LGBTQ young people and the impact that ex acceptance can have on them. Um, often we're when we're talking about LGBT people and young people especially actually, um, we are, um, focusing on sort of the disparities and the negative outcomes. And often those conversations are punctuated with violence and fear and loss and discrimination. And that is a very real, very important story that we need to spend time thinking about. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, when LGBT people have access to resources, when we're seen and validated, um, we have access to social support systems and uh, welcoming warm families where we're loved and supported. Um, we do great. We, we do fine. We have good outcomes. We have counter outcomes to the negative outcomes that we can experience um, in the other direction. And so um, we wanted to spend some time today talking about that and why it is so important to be fighting for um, inclusion in public spaces. Um, and we also know that families um, are kind of the first and most important place to receive support and affirmation. Um, and so, Christy, I wondered if we could start the conversation with talking about um, some of the ways that 
parental and family support positively impacts youth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I love most about P4P is that every parent who participates there comes oftentimes initially saying, I don't know how to do this, but I absolutely have to figure it out because my kid is the most important piece of this and I love them, period, right? Um, and so I think when we see parents and, and extended families engaging with their kids around these identities as though, of course, it's who you are. And of course, that's a beautiful part of you. And of course, we love those aspects of you. What we see is that, that our queer and trans kids adjustment is exactly like everyone else's. And we see that their mental health doesn't take any hits, right? If, if they're just accepted as who they are within their family and embraced in that way, um, they get to enjoy so many of the um, things that we kind of take for granted for our kids. It doesn't mean they don't have problems or they don't struggle with understanding their identity or things like that. It just means that they're not adding an extra layer of having to swim through the sludge to try to find who they are. They, they get to just be that. Um, and from a mental health perspective, I would so happily not have any clients because that's how all of our um, queer and trans folks were received at home. That'd be a, an awesome reason for me to find a new job. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, I wish there was a way, maybe as a psychologist, you can, you know how to articulate this better than me, but it's, it's sort of like the exact opposite. Like if we, if we exclude trans kids, if we tell them that, you know, we don't believe them, we don't welcome them in, we create uh, isolation for them, then yeah. negative outcomes go up. Suicidality goes up, depression goes up, anxiety goes up. And when we include kids in things and welcome them and listen to them and accept them, then all of those things go down. It's just right. a very like simple arithmetic actually. Yeah, I think you said that really well, Cameron. You're spot on. <laughs> um, so uh, related to families and things, at our last panel, we discussed a really great article that um, described the intersection um, between parents and trans youth. Uh, something that I think that the parents on the panel have experienced is that often um, parents are way behind their kids in terms of understanding um, their identity and what's going on. Um, and that can create a gap in their connection and uh, the space for parents to be supportive. But when parents do some work, they can meet their kids at that intersection. And that intersection is sort of this, the moment where parents and families become allies to their kids and they then move forward together on a path forward. I wondered if any of you could talk a little bit about um, what changed for you or for your kid or for your family um, when you hit that intersection and your family became a place of support for your kids. I thought about that a little bit, uh, Cameron, after we talked about that the other day. I think that a lot of times families that come to us talk about how they don't um, understand everything and they come to us, I feel like sometimes with this idea that we're going to be able to just give them all this information, which we can, it takes a little time, but um, I think it's really important to remember as a parent that you don't have to understand everything to be a supportive parent. Um, it's hard. I get it. Um, and you don't have to understand everything to be supportive. And you'll probably never really fully understand your child's journey, especially if they're um, not a member of the community that you're a member of. So um, it's their journey. It's not your journey. I think it's just important to stand beside them and continue to learn and give them your unconditional support and love along the way. And I think one of the things I want to throw in and one of the things that the group really helped me with um, that it's okay for it to be hard for you. Um, I thought when it was such a hard thing to grasp, to understand, to start supporting, I thought that must mean I'm not a supportive parent because this is hard. And it, it really took some help to realize it's okay for it to be hard. It's okay for you to kind of mourn what you thought was, was the path your child was on, um, but you need to celebrate them. And so our parents group has been great because when I have struggled, I've talked to my, you know, my fellow parents, I don't bring that to my child. So they have enough going on with um, trying to understand their identity, navigate the, you know, the new reality before them without us continuously coming to them with questions or doubts. Um, every single one of us, I think, started with saying, well, maybe it's just a face. 
And, and so that's one of the things new parents come in all the time. And I, I have stopped myself from laughing because we've all been there, you know, and it's okay. And you just have to accept, okay, you know what? I don't understand my child's path and identity like they do. And we just have to be supportive and understanding. And I think once I got to the point where I realized, kind of like Michelle said, I don't have to fully understand it to be completely 100% supportive of my child and their journey. I would hands down agree with that, Jen. Um, and I think for our family, it looked a little bit different because both my husband and I had been activists in the queer and trans community for a very long time before our kids came out. But one of the things that was really surprising for us is that even though our kids had seen that, even though they'd been to marches and vigils and other things with us over time, they were still afraid to come out. And one of my kids said, um, when I said, really, you were afraid of that? Like, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And they said, well, you know, sometimes what your parents are for everybody else doesn't match what your parents are for you. Um, and so that was, I think, an important moment for me as a parent to that kid of recognizing that I actually do have to put things in words. I have to make sure that this kid knows they're included in how I feel and think and behave with other folks in the queer and trans community. And so that became kind of a part of our communication for a while of like, you know, this counts for you too, or when I said that thing, I, I mean you too. And and occasionally now, it's been a number of years now, but occasionally um, the older of, of those kids will say to me, and you mean me too, right? Um, and so it's kind of become a joke, but it was really an important moment, I think, in our relationship and figuring some of those things out together because I was just taking for granted that they knew. Yeah, I think that that really speaks to the need to just like, you really have to, you have to say it out loud and you have to articulate it and, and make sure that you're being heard because the messaging, counter messaging is so loud and so powerful um, that it, it takes that direct communication, I think. Did, did you all notice any, like what changed for your kid when you became, and like they knew that you were on their side? They knew it was for them too. <laughs> I think the thing that comes to mind for me is just their happiness. They're just feeling of safety and just how happy they were able to feel and then show it. It was like night and day. It was like just this light kind of came back. Um, I, I feel like with all of our kids, they, they haven't, they didn't really surprise me. My other kids, um, whenever they, you know, Noah kind of explained his journey to them um, it wasn't a surprise because they've always been great, supportive, inclusive kids, but seeing them kind of step up, um, introduce themselves with pronouns, uh, not, uh, not making assumptions about who other people are, um, calling out negative behavior or even something as simple as we would go see an Avengers movie and they would call out how not every role is represented in every cast. And maybe that's not a, uh, a TV show we want to watch or um, a public figure that we want to support. So seeing that in them, I think was really helpful for my trans kid to see. Um, even far away. Uh, our oldest lives in Philadelphia and she took it upon herself with her company to support a uh, project in her city that supported trans women that were in need of housing. And it was kind of like a, kind of like the center project, except in Philadelphia, <laughs> specifically for trans women. And so, although she's always been an ally, and she's always been a supportive person. I don't think it would have ever maybe been on her radar to seek out and support that particular group had it not been for her experience with our son. Um, so for her to step up and, and play a part in that huge commitment to that particular community and that big city was just so uh, heartwarming and great for my kid to see. Um, so, and, but even little things, little things when they hear, um, you know, that, 
I'm volunteering for Pride Fest. And so that feels good to them to know that I'm, you know, jumping in with both feet. And, you know, whenever my kid introduces themselves with a pronoun that they weren't doing those things before, just all those little things really make a difference. I think in our family, what happened is it made um, different things available. So for example, if I'm struggling with my anxiety around my identity and not quite knowing where I fit and what people are going to say and how people are going to respond to me, when it became clear that like all the good stuff was available and we could have those conversations in a whole different kind of way. Um, but it also opened up opportunity for really fun stuff like going to Pride together or um, we took a trip a couple years ago um, when it was the anniversary of Stonewall and World Pride was in D.C. and we went as a family and marched in the parade with an organization that we're connected to and um, we did that together and it was just so it opened up all of that fun celebratory stuff like drag shows and and Pride parades and Pride experiences and like a new movie came out and whoa they portrayed queer people as like normal romance people let's watch that movie together so it did all that stuff too which helps with you know just celebrating the same way we might celebrate any kid you know that was in our our family and I'd say the same thing when my daughter um kind of realized that we're on board we're there we're accepting it really kind of one you can see the joy again you know that she had kind of lost and the other kind of thing is um, like one of the things we would do is we had awkward conversation Fridays. That's what I started because there's some things that just are a little awkward to talk to your parents about, but you know what? They're things that we had to talk about. And so um, I would call it awkward conversation Friday. And so I would go in to our room and say, okay, what conversation do we need to have? What is it you want to talk to me about, but is hard to talk to, about, to me about. And so I think just opening those lines of communication and her understanding that, you know, I'm going to screw up sometimes. I do, I still do. And it's been years, um, but that I love her and support her. And I'm doing my best to be the best supporter and ally to her as possible. I love the way that those stories kind of speak to um, also like it opens up a space for real genuine bonding and connection and relationship between parents and kids. And I think, you know, when we're talking about like opposites, opposite directions, I think the opposite thing that happens is that kids, young people walk away from their families because they can't, that's not a safe space for them and they lose those relationships. And um, sometimes that's a really heartbreaking thing. And, um, but, you know, having these connections and showing up as an ally, as a parent, creates like these opportunities for awkward conversations on Fridays and going out to events together and, and building bonds between siblings like you were talking about, Michelle. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's positive impact there. Um, Paige, I want to give you a chance to jump in if you want. I know we're not talking about anything, but do you have any experiences related to like your, you know, feeling accepted in your family and things like that? Yeah, definitely. So my journey in my family acceptance was a little bit slower and it was more of that down um, reaction for a while where there was a very strained relationship for many, many years. And then last year, they, I was like, this is kind of my last effort. I'm inviting them to my, to my partner's house for Christmas. This is the last ditch effort. And they all came, they brought my grandma and they were all so nice. My grandma very limited worldview on those things, walks in the door, immediately hugs my partner and says, welcome to the family. And it was just a really great experience. And now like, it feels like a weight has been lifted off my shoulder that I didn't even know I was carrying. Mm. Um, and like previous to that, I really like me and my family just spoke when we needed to, but now like since then we've talked almost every day and it's just been really nice to have like that joy and connectedness back in my life. Totally. Totally. I, I feel like I want to shout out to my mom too, because I have a very similar journey um, where, you know, there was not, maybe people didn't understand it at first. That's a very normal thing. And, um, you know, I've been out for a long time, but um, after we worked through those awkward times at the beginning, um, I have a much closer relationship with my parents, um, actually my whole family, um, because I feel like I can show up a hundred percent authentically with them. There's nothing that I need to hide. Um, so um, so I want to just jump uh, topics a little bit um, and talk a little bit about this legislative stuff. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty of the 
of the legislation itself, um, but we know it's happening and we know it has an impact on young people. Um, and so I wondered if we could use our own experiences to talk about some of that. One um, piece of legislation that's coming forward is um, trying to keep um, young people from accessing affirming care, gender affirming health care, which can look a lot of different ways. I think there's some assumptions that gender affirming health care equals surgery, which it does not. Sometimes gender affirming health care just equals like having a doctor that believes you. Um, and so uh, could you all speak to what the impact was for your child um, when they maybe even before they actually received the gender affirming health care, but when they were on that path for getting um, gender affirming health care. Can you help us understand how that changed your child's trajectory? Sure. Um, when my daughter had first come out and she had talked to us, we had talked about gender affirming health care and we weren't kind of, as Cameron mentioned at the beginning, she had been living with this much longer than we had. So we were a little slower to come around, um, but we came around pretty quickly and realized that, you know, for, for teenagers and they're getting all these hormones and, and, you know, those years are so hard anyway, but you know, think about if you were getting the wrong hormones and things were changing in your body that don't fit your, your, you know, what, who you are inside. And so when my daughter started hormone therapy, um, it was like night and day, you know, and it's funny because I'll see other parents will ask, well, how long did it take to work? And I'm like, just the fact she started, she felt so much better, you know, that, I don't know how long it took the actual hormones to make that big of a difference um, because it was just so good for her to be kind of like, finally, they understand, they, you know, they support me. And, and so I think that that's kind of was our experience was it was a hard thing for us to start. Um, but once we did no looking back, you know, it was just night and day difference with how she felt. I agree. I feel like everybody's journey is so different. And so what gender affirming care might look like for one person, it can just be vastly different um, from what it looks like for another person. And I think in our experience, just the knowledge that that care, whatever it was going to look like in the future was going to be available and we were gonna do whatever we had to do to get there was like a switch um, for our child. And knowing that we were on board to help them through that journey, no matter what it was going to be. I feel like, like what Jen said, it was like night and day. It was like a, it was like the light kind of came back for them. So, um, you know, you always have to make a plan and you have to have a timeline and everybody's timeline will be different. But, um, I think just the knowledge alone, honestly, I feel like almost within moments you can see the change, the positive change that that can make for your child or your loved one. I think the one thing that I would add, both in my experience in my family, but also with a lot of folks that I've worked with professionally for a long time, is that what, what my experience is, and this probably isn't true for every single human, but as access to care goes up, depression and anxiety go down, suicidality goes down, I start to feel more comfortable in my own skin. And I mean, there's just, the difference for me is um, my mental health is rocky versus my mental health feels solid, even if imperfect, but I feel like I'm on solid ground and, and have more of what I need to thrive in the world. So, I mean, and, and that, that fit, you know, and is continuing to fit, you know, for our kids as well as for folks that I've worked with um, clinically. Yeah. Right. It's um, all, it's all so simple. It just feels like almost so silly to even debate it because why shouldn't that just be the case for every person? Yeah. Last week um, at PRISM, we did a fun intro, like icebreaker activity. And one of the questions was what the kids goals were, or what they were looking forward to. And almost half of the kids, like once one kid said, said it, it like made space for everyone else. They were like, I want to start getting gender affirming care, typically hormones was what they were talking about last week. By the end of the year, I wanna talk about it with my parents and try to talk with them and get on board with a healthcare provider. And once one of them said it, they were like, oh my gosh, this is a possibility for me. Like all of their faces were lighting up. They were talking about it with each other and they were so excited. And um, it was just really great to hear, like see them in a safe space and get excited. And um, so many of them were looking forward to and planning to talk with their parents about it. 
Yeah, it was just such a night and day difference for my child. And it just breaks my heart that um, the legislature who doesn't have a handle on what transgender children go through, they don't have a medical degree, um, are trying to make these healthcare decisions for our children. Um, it, it is not like, you know, you make this decision and suddenly, you know, they're on hormones, they're getting surgery, any of that kind of stuff. There's a whole team of people working with the child to make sure everything is going right. There's usually a psychologist on board. There's an endocrinologist, there's a family doctor, there's you know, all these different supports to make sure that these choices are right. And to think that somebody outside my sphere could know better than me what my child needs is just um, very frustrating. Cameron, I want to say one other thing. I'm sorry, I know we need to probably move on, but I think this feels really important to me right now because I'm working with a lot of folks um, that I think it's really important to note that access to gender affirming care doesn't mean I go from this gender to that gender. There's a lot of gray space in here and sometimes folks make multiple transitions. It doesn't mean that the first one was wrong. It means that it was an important part of the journey of how I was understanding myself in that moment. And so I think I think we have to make space for people's journeys to not always look linear or not always have an end goal that you might be thinking of as an outsider for that person. Um, just It just feels really important to be able to say that out loud. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, that's a great point. It's a great point. Yeah, I think sometimes like gender affirming care is really just having a provider or a team of providers that believe you, that see you, and that are going to meet you where you are and help you meet your needs, whatever those are. Yeah, that's a great point, Christy. Um, so yeah, continuing on with the conversation, because we just have an hour, we could talk about these things, for, I mean, like all day. Uh, we, we were at the Capitol talking about these issues for what, like eight hours a couple of Tuesdays ago, and we it, it wasn't even done when we were done. Um, but one of the big conversations that is coming up in legislation all around the country, but especially here in Missouri, is um, keeping, um, tra keeping trans kids, but admittedly, every conversation is trans girls. Um, off of teams with other girls of uh, team sports. Um, and so um, we know that playing team sports is incredibly impactful for young people. It's a really, really important resource for, you know, team building skills and self-esteem skills and social development and all kinds of things. Um, and it's important that all kids have access to those kinds of um, extracurricular activities and resources. Um, Jen, I think your daughter is like the, the athletic one in the group. Um, and I know your family has had a lot of experiences um, with her being able to play sports with the other girls at school. Um, and so I wondered if you could speak a little bit about your family's experience and also how that impacted her being able to play and, and maybe even other her, other teammates. Yeah, um, thank you for this opportunity because it is a different um, a different process because when my um, cisgender daughter wanted to play a sport, all she had to do was go to a meeting after school and you know and go to try out. Um, when my transgender daughter wanted to be on a team, I was like, okay, let's, let's get this done. And it was a long process where you have to have doctor's notes. You have to have been um, getting hormone treatment for over a year. You had to have a psychologist note, a doctor's note, a, you know, some, a third party note. And um, plus you have to have your grades checked every year. I'm like, the other, don't the other kids have, you know, anyway, that's a whole other story. So anyway, so we went through this process and it probably took three to four months um, before she was cleared. And she, just about the time that she started practices, she was cleared to play. And one of the things that's so frustrating about this conversation is that Misha has had this policy in place for over 10 years. And over that 10 year period, there have been four transgender girls that wanted to play sports in Missouri. So that there's about 700, or sorry, 70,000 kids that play high school sports in Missouri, four transgender girls. And this narrative is being argued, in fact, um, not to get political, but one of the parties has said, this is their number one issue. And I'm like, how can this be the number one issue? We have schools that are falling apart. We have roads that are falling apart, you know? Um, and, and all of this hubba baloo for four girls that wanted to play sports, my daughter was one of them. She played one year of junior varsity. She didn't take a spot from anybody. She didn't take a scholarship from anybody. She wanted to participate. And that was the first time she participated on a team with her school. And there was so much she learned from that. And the other thing is her teammates learned a lot. Um, she was on a sports team with a lot of 
girls that had never been around another transgender, had been around a transgender person before. And so it was also a good experience for them to learn and be around somebody that's different than them. So it didn't just benefit my child, it benefited that entire team. And, and so I, it's very frustrating. I've been up to the Capitol twice now to testify against this. And just to understand that everyone should have the same rights, the same participation. Um, like I said, this has been in the process for over 10 years and there has never been, you know, you can't name one of those students because nobody got a scholarship and took it away from somebody else. The Olympics have had this, you know, have had rules in place. Um, NCAA has found a way to allow transgender athletes to participate fairly. And so it really is a matter of, um, you know, just like it wasn't about water fountains. This isn't really truly about transgender girls playing sports. They're trying to find the boogeyman to make people scared. And all these kids want to do is play. And even though it only affected, you know, there's four girls that affected, this is the message that all transgender kids in our state are hearing is that you are not the same, you are not worthy, you do not have the same rights as everyone. So while the number of kids it affects to actually play these sports, it's so much bigger than that because the message that these kids are getting, the damage that happens to these kids by hearing these types of things over and over again in the news is incredibly traumatic. Yeah, yeah it really it really is. It, it is a point well made that um, not, there's only these four girls that this is impacting, and but in reality, it's impacting everybody. It's it's trans people all around our, our state, all around our country, and it's also not trans people. You know, other students, in the same way that you were talking about when she was on the team with her teammates, they're getting the experience of team building with somebody that's different than them. Um, and when we use this negative messaging about trans people, we're also telling cis students that trans kids are other, trans kids don't belong, and, and that has a big impact as well. Um, sort of similar actually to being able to like see other people who are different than us and learn from the experiences of diversity in our culture. Um, another big thing that's happening right now in particular poignant um, at an event hosted by the library is the nationwide effort to sort of remove um, books from our shelves and research has indicated, I mean, I know a lot of the talking points don't say that this is directed at LGBT people, but the, when you look at the books that are being removed, I think 40% of them um, are removed because of LGBT content, um, which removes opportunities for young LGBT people to see themselves reflected in the media and for non-LGBT people to learn about um, LGBT people existing. Um, so I wondered um, if, uh, um, Paige, if you wanted to talk a little bit, you're uh, sort of our, <laughs> if Jen has the athletic daughter, Paige is our book nerd. <laughs> yes. um, and I, I'm open to the parents as well, but I wanted to uh, start with you, Paige, if you could speak a little bit about your experience with books and, and your reflections on what's happening right now. Yeah, definitely. So obviously I love to read. Um, books have always been a very important thing to me. Struggling with uh, some mental health issues growing up, books were always my escape. Now that like the point I'm kind of on the other side, my therapist will say, your goal this year is to read 50 books or less because that means you're having a good mental health year. <laughs> um, but there have been um, several points in books that have kind of brought me along my way. So the first story I want to share is um, I was in middle school obsessed with John Green, like all the other middle schoolers were, and I got his book, Will Grayson, Will Grayson, and I was reading it, and my parents found out it featured uh, the main characters were two gay boys, and they took it from me, and they threw it away, and I just remember that just like gutted me, and I was in the closet, and it was just, it made me feel, it, it, showed that it wasn't safe. This wasn't a supporting environment. Um, and then also on the flip side, there have been books that I've read um, more in adulthood that have really helped shape my point of view and uh, helped me feel really comfortable in the community. Um, so the first one is a, a very highly uh, contended. Highly banned. Um, yes. <laughs> My highly banned book, if anyone <laughs> wants it, let me know. <laughs> um, 
But uh, Gender Queer, uh, I read it a couple years ago and it really helped me on get started and understand more about my gender identity and reading that book at a younger age, reading about someone else's experiences, I think would have helped me figure it out and accept things a little bit sooner instead of just now finally like being exposed to it in adulthood. Um, the second book is this book is gay. It is not quite as uh, contentious as gender queer, but it is still a highly banned book. Um, I read this book at the beginning of college. I was, I just kind of left um, the area I grew up in and was getting really immersed in the queer community and finding, finding my found family and people that accepted me. And this book I think is written for like high schoolers, but it was really great. It gave me like a crash course on, hey, this is everything that you've missed like <laughs> growing up and not uh, having these experiences as a kid. It kind of just, I felt like it caught me up to it. So I love that book. It helped me a lot. And I also, this is a book on our shelves at our Center Project Library. And I have multiple teens that have come up to me and been like, ooh, that rainbow book, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> they borrow it and they're all so excited to talk about this book. So it's still definitely a book that has a great amount of need and helps our youth a lot today. Thank you. I, I definitely also have books. I could, we could, this is another big conversation that we could spend a lot of time oh, on. Oh yeah, hours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I almost feel like it's a universal experience. Obviously, we're talking about LGBT kids here, but a lot of us have had the experience of like feeling alone and then finding a book and just being like, oh my God, like finally, I'm not alone. I'm, I'm, something's reflecting back to me. Um, do For the parents that are on the panel, do you all know if your kids had any of those experiences or any of your kids readers or anything? Yeah, that was um, that was a big deal for one of our two kids, um, and it wasn't just books. It was because they struggled to find themselves in books. They're old enough that mm -hmm. they really struggled growing up to find depictions of queer and trans folk that were positive or healthy and not focused on like the struggle and the rejection and the bad stuff, right? <sighs> And so um, Glee, when Glee came out, like that was a big deal in our house because it was like the first time they'd seen a celebration of queer and trans folk. And so I think, you know, now looking, there's so many things out there for kids who are, are growing up and seeing that. But um, I'm seeing a, a question in our chat about how young is too young. And I would say there is never a too young. And so we, with our grandkids now are, reading books like Julian is a Mermaid and um, What Makes a Baby, which if you haven't seen it, is a beautiful genderless explanation of how babies are created in the world. And we have, I, I could go on, we've got a stack of books <laughs> that, that we read that are all about saying, whoever you are, whoever your friends are, whoever the people in your life are, they're beautiful. Um, and so the books I think are a really important piece of that. And for our, the older of our two kids who are on this journey, fan fiction became the thing. They couldn't find their own books. And so they went to fan fiction sites with other kids who were writing and creating that kind of work for their, like to validate their own story. And mm -hmm. that was a, like a pivotal thing to find those stories in fan fiction and then to start writing those. Yeah. I love the idea that kids were saving themselves. Go ahead, go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, I think it's also to keep, it's also important to keep in mind that the vast majority of books on the shelves for our um, elementary and preschool age kids, probably, I don't have my numbers in front of me, but I know it's at least 55% of those books feature cisgender, white families with a mom and a dad at home. That's the majority of the books that our kids see. The next, the next biggest uh, category, feature animals is the main characters. That's probably... 30%. I mean, it's a huge number. The vast majority of the books out there do not include every child. So if you um, are a member of the black and brown community, of the queer community, it is very unlikely that you're going to see your face in the pages of a book. So the fact that they are all, they are trying to ban so many of these books and the vast majority speak to single parents raising a child, two moms at home, two dads at home, a foster family, black and brown children, those make up, I believe it's like 8% of the preschool books feature black and brown children. That's astonishing to me. 
So it is such a dangerous thing to have these bans taking place right now because the amount of books available to these children are, it's already so small. It's already so small. So I feel like we're just going to eliminate the places where these kids can identify with characters in these stories when these bans take place. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems like that's sort of the point a little bit. And mm -hmm. with the end goal being like, maybe if kids aren't exposed to um, LGBT families, then they won't be LGBT, um, with the assumption being that there's something wrong with being LGBT, but there's nothing wrong with being LGBT. And we exist, <laughs> we, we just exist, and we have existed for all the time, whether or not we had books. Um, I'm old enough that I, I really struggled to find books that I could see myself in, and it was a breath of fresh air when I was finally exposed to things and it, it didn't, I mean, I still am who I am. It just took me a lot longer and a many, many more years of feeling isolated and separated from my community to get there. Um, and that's why books are so important. We can help kids at, at such a, an earlier point. But, um, and I think that's a good point because, you know, people, that's the argument is that we're exposing kids to things and it could make them gay. Um, my daughter read almost exclusively books in her youth with, like Michelle said, cisgendered white families. Um, and she's still trans, you know, <laughs> if, if it worked one way, wouldn't it work the other way? Um, it, it's just, it's, it's one of those things that's just very frustrating as a parent because my kids should be able to see themselves as well in those things, in those books, in those stories. Um, and my daughter, you asked about, you know, our kids being readers really was more into sci-fi and I think part of the reason why is that's not a very gendered area, you know, within sci-fi stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that occurred to me just as you were speaking too, is like, if we, you know, when, uh, when you see yourself represented in a book or, or wherever in the media, then you start to get an idea of like, oh, that could be me. Like my life could look like that. So like, a, you know, a cisgender kid, says they read this book in preschool and they think, oh, maybe someday I'm gonna grow up and marry a person or like whatever. Um, and if you don't see yourself, then that sort of creates this like, <laughs> like empty, like, oh, I don't know if I even exist. And that can get really complicated, like psychologically to be like, I don't see a future for myself. Um, so. Um, okay, so I'm seeing the time. It's 1248. We wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about like really kindness and how can we like what does it mean to be kind? Um, and we've talked a little bit about how it is often just these like little things make a huge impact. Um, but I wanted to delve into that a little bit more. Um, Paige, you're uh, one of the coordinators for PRISM and kind of <laughs> did our like some recon for us. Go talk to the youth and see what the youth think. Um, so I wondered if you could share with us a little bit about like what you heard from them about maybe how they're doing or like what can adults be doing to be more kinder and accepting and inclusive of them. Yeah, definitely. Um, so they all, when everyone said when I said like what is going well, they were like Pride Fest. Columbia Pride Fest is like our favorite thing ever. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> they're all raving about that for so long um and then they were talking about they want to have more events and spaces like that because it really is when they go there they know that everyone else attending will accept them for who they are and it allows them to just like take a breath and just be kids like those they know that those are safe spaces for them to just be kids in it um something I thought was interesting they said there are some apps that have maps of safe LGBTQ spaces in the area and so they're starting I had never heard of that before but they're starting to like make kind of those are like the areas that they go and hang out in and they're making these spaces for um for themselves and really enjoying that um I also asked them what like what signals to them that a space is safe? What, um, how do they know that where they're going, a teacher's classroom is going to be a safe space for them? Um, they said that one, ask, obviously asking pronouns instead of assuming is um, a sign that it's going to be a welcoming space. Lots of pride decorations. They love the pride decorations. Um, and one thing that was really interesting that they emphasized and they spoke on it quite a bit is 
just creating mutual respect of not, I'm an adult, so you listen to me, or I'm your teacher, so you have to listen to me. Just creating um, a space where there's mutual respect, it makes them feel safe. They know that they are also respected and that their identities and who they are will be valued. That's awesome. That's like a bullet point, <laughs> a bullet point list. <laughs> Um, you said something interesting just like right off the bat um, about safe spaces and creating more safe spaces. And I have to say again, I love that like, I think one of the strengths of the LGBT community of LGBT people is that we will figure out a way for ourselves. If it doesn't yeah. exist, then we will make it exist. And so like um, creating a little map, I just, I just love that. Um, writing fan fiction, I love that. <laughs> um, but we, when we were preparing for this, um, uh, I think Jen and Michelle, you both, maybe all three of you all shared stories about your kids finally accessing safe spaces and how impactful that was for them. I wondered if you would be willing to share some of that. Um, yeah, yeah, well, I know whenever, whenever, um, am I, I'm not muted, am I? Okay. Sure, <laughs> um, no, whenever my child first started um, in high school and, you know, we were struggling and just to walk into the counselor's office and immediately see that rainbow flag over on the corner of the desk or a sign on the door that said, this is a safe, splay, safe space or a little rainbow flag somewhere on the, in the room. All of those things are so affirming and just kind of let you take a breath, you know, like, okay, I can, I don't have to wiggle around a subject. I can be who I am. And ask the questions I need to ask because this person is safe. And I don't think people realize how big of an impact those tiny little things have. Um, you know, I know Jen, a lot of times I see her in a rainbow sweatshirt. She just recently knitted a rainbow scarf. I usually see Christy's husband, Howard in a rainbow hat. Um, it's just, it's interesting, like a sticker, a coffee cup, um, a, something on your desk, it goes a long way. It's just a simple way to demonstrate to other people around you that you're a supportive and safe person. And it shows those members of the community that they're not alone. So um, yeah, I, w that happened to us personally. And I mean, I, I wear my sticker, a pin, a bracelet almost every time I go out. Um, I keep a sticker on the back of my phone. I'm very purposeful that I flip my phone over and lay it on the counter every single time I check out, no matter where I am. I just, I just know that one of these days I'm gonna, I'm just, it's just gonna be a little nod to somebody in that room that, hey, there's somebody here that is supportive for you. And I, I believe that to be true because I have had young people comment before to me, just like I know many people in our group um, at P4P have also had that same thing happen when they're wearing a sweatshirt or they have a sticker on their shirt or on their car window. It just, it's helpful to those, especially youth in the community to know that there are people out there, um, you know, that have their back. Absolutely. One of the stories that I always go back to with this and, and not that it's all about me, um, but when my daughter came out to me, as trans female the night before eighth grade started. And so I was a mess because I was like, okay, now we've got to figure out all these things. We've got to figure out bathrooms. We've got to figure out pronouns. We've got to figure out names and all this kind of stuff. Um, and when we went to the school and went to each of the different classrooms, I sat down in one of the classrooms and looked up and there was a, um, a poster that was a pride poster. And it was like, 50 pounds came off my shoulders and I just sat, I just relaxed. I'm like, my child will be safe here. Mm -hmm. And, and it hit me. I'm like, if this makes me feel this much better, how much better does it make these kids feel that they know this is a space where they can exist as themselves and not have to constantly be on guard for who's going to, you know, use the wrong pronouns, who's going to make microaggressions, um, regarding transgender and gay people. Um, and so it's just so important. And it, I hate the fact that we're starting to see some places try to ban having um, pride flags in schools because it really does send a message to these kids who often don't have a lot of support either at home or you know, an extended family that here is one place I can be me and it's okay. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. It does matter. The, uh, people, I don't think people really understand how much like, a rainbow sticker makes a huge difference. And even people don't even talk to you necessarily. They just seeing it makes a big difference. Um, I want to also speak to something that Paige talked about, about kids kind of 
I probably through word of mouth are kind of creating this little map in their heads about all the safe spaces in Columbia or in their communities. And um, actually a member of our group um, works at the Missouri Disabilities Association, and they've recently partnered to create this app that is available. Um, and it um, maps out gender inclusive and uh, just inclusive in general restrooms around Missouri. So I remember that being an issue whenever my trans kid wanted to uh, take a road trip to St. Louis at one time. And I, you know, being this worried parent, I'm trying to remember ahead of time, okay, what are the bathrooms that would be safe for you to stop at? I know that just seems maybe trivial to some people who don't walk that path, but as a parent of an LGBTQ kid, that is something that you are concerned about. And so we'll figure out a way to get a link to that app so that other people can be more aware of it, maybe um, after we post this video. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool. Um, if others would like to share some ideas about, about ways to uh, do kindness to LGBT people, I would welcome that. I'm also gonna throw up um, a little page um, that I made about just like ideas. A lot of these are things that we've already talked about. Um, and one thing I wanna say is that like, the little things really do matter. Um, there's all kinds of things that we can do about learning and increasing our understanding and, and showing up and, and all of it. But um, often people in marginalized communities experience what's called microaggressions. Somebody just said that. And um, those are like, have been described as like little tiny cuts. They're like little paper cuts that happen all the time, day in and day out. Um, and they look all kinds of different ways. And I think one of the nicest, uh, a way to think about being kind to LGBT people is to consider um, instead of a thousand little cuts, try to do like a thousand little band-aids or a thousand little kisses or a thousand little things that are so tiny that make up for all those cuts that, the, that young people are experiencing. Um, other things that we've talked about already on this panel, just to kind of wrap up are, um, you know, making an effort to educate yourself, but not utilizing LGBT young people themselves as the source of information that can be a big burden for LGBT young people. Um, and also really making an effort to listen and empathize and, and see a full authentic person in front of you when you're interacting with your kid or the young people in your life. Um, and then, um, yeah, like we've said, visibility matters, um, you know, using your voice to speak when other people can't, um, supporting the local programming in your community. Um, does anybody have anything else that they wanna add real quick before we wrap up about I ways of kind? I do. Um, I think, honestly, I feel like one of the most important things that I've learned about being an ally, like a true authentic ally is to show up. I think it's so important that as an ally, we learn about the community. We um, volunteer, accompany someone to an event like a pride event, uh, a community demonstration, a support meeting. Um, make yourself aware, like you were saying, don't put the burden on that young person, but make yourself aware of the current laws that have passed or ones that are currently on the table. Write letters to your legislators to challenge those laws that would lead to their unfair treatment. Um, but like you said, I also feel like we need to remember that we have to show up not only for those big, profound moments and events, but also in those small, mundane times as well. I think it's important to ask your own family member, your trans loved one, how you can best support them, because it's going to look different for everyone. Um, simple things, take them out to lunch, bring them a coffee. Tell them it's okay to show up late or it's okay to leave early if that would help support their mental health. I think it's important and I've made the commitment to not let a single transphobic joke or comment or any piece of misinformation go unchecked in my presence. So if I hear someone say something that needs to be challenged, I will take it upon myself to challenge that. Um, I think we just need to love and support our kids and do whatever we can to create conditions that lead to their peace and it's it really is just that simple. Cameron, I know we are super short on time. I have two really simple things. Yeah, go for it. Don't gender things, right? If you're asking if somebody's dating, ask if they're dating. Don't ask if they have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Like just take the gender out of all of those basic conversations um, that we're having. Um, you know, I'm just gonna leave it there because we're at time. <laughs> Cameron, we did have somebody put a question in. 
And yeah, I just we did. talked to it super quick. I know that we're running out of time. And it was how young is too young for a child to know that they're transgender or for when you should support them. And I would just say it's it's uncanny how some of these young kids know themselves so well. And if they're telling you that they're a girl or they're a boy and that's not what you had originally thought, you really do need to listen um, because it, and it's okay not to put a label on it. It's okay not to, you know, consider them transgender at this point or but maybe that they're just... Um, gender fluid or they're just exploring their identity. Um, but you need to listen because who knows themselves better than them. And there's a difference between I wish I was and I am a, and, and that's another thing that we've kind of learned. And so, uh, and a lot of times kids don't have the language to express it very well. So I think we just really need to do listen to them. And, you know, there's not a whole lot you need to do in terms of, um, you know, planning for puberty or anything when the kid's three or four, um, but just to listen and let them explore and figure out who they are, I think it's just so important. And these are the kids that tend to be the most well-adjusted of the transgender community when they have had that love and support from the time they were very little. Yeah. And, and I, do have one, I do have one more comment if we have a second. Yeah. I know Paige was talking about how the kids just really feel so much joy and happiness when they reflect on uh, Pride Fest. And as someone who has volunteered for Pride Fest, I would encourage everybody to get online and look up Midmo Pride and see how you can volunteer and how you can be a part of that experience because it is the most joyous, positive filled weekend. And if you can immerse yourself in it for just an hour or even several months as a volunteer, <laughs> um, it will change your life. It's amazing. Cameron, there's one, there's, there are several pieces to the question that's in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, but one of them is what if they step forward and then step back? And that is absolutely 100% okay, whether they're stepping back because it was too hard to be who they are in that moment, whether they're stepping back because they were exploring and figuring something out and they want to explore in a different way, whatever that journey is, like it, it is not an uncommon thing for somebody to foray in a direction and then for any number of reasons to maybe shift gears and, and look at or try on um, some other hats as they're trying to understand who they are and find like what is this and, and, and what is what makes sense for me and so when that happens um just supporting that journey and you know in our house we've had a lot of names we've had a lot of pronouns we've had a lot of labels and um along that journey it's wherever the kids are in that moment that's where we tried to show up and be with them and when people around us question that or use that as evidence that it wasn't real or it was a phase, you know, we did a lot of educating ourselves to make sure that we could respond to those um, kinds of things, but always from the perspective of having our kids back. There, there was no like, oh, I know it's like, you know, it was always, yep. And they're trying to understand something that's really complex that you've never had to think about. And it makes sense to me that it maybe you don't quite understand it immediately and you have to do some figuring that. Yeah. I love this group, this panel, this panel. I feel like we could continue this conversation for a really long time. We did not even cover like all of what we had planned to cover today. Um, but I also want to be super respectful of people's time. So if I could just end on one note, I wanted to say thank you again to the library and to the Children's Grove for creating this space. And in particular, the motto of the Children's Grove is that a single act of kindness can change a life forever. And I feel like that is just particularly relevant and salient with this community um, and what our message is today that that truly a single one-on-one -on -one act of kindness can make a big difference for an LGBT young person. So thank you again so much for having us. We're really happy to be here. And check out the P4P Facebook page because I know we didn't answer all the questions. And so we are happy to do that in our parents group on Facebook or at a meeting. So if you haven't connected to Parents for Parents on Facebook, it's a great place to get your questions answered. Thank you all for being here. Thank the audience for being here. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I said it was recorded. So um, in a few days, it'll be up and I'll make sure that Children's Grove and the Center Project both get links to the recording when it goes up. And I put the old recording in the chat. So thank you all so much for your time and attention to this very important support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.